Hello. Any questions you have? This is a good time. I have one thing. What if we know something about the uncertainty about the G matrix? How can we take that into account when we try to invert for model parameters? Yeah, so I think that's a most excellent question. I sketched a bit of a procedure two lectures ago when I, three maybe, when I said, you know, if you don't know G, then you can try a G, you carry it through and you see what you get. Then you pick a different G mm -hmm. and then you try again and then you do the chi scale test and you could do the F test and you can basically hope this is one way to procedurally work out what the best G should be. Mm -hmm. that's, that's part one of my answer. Part two mm -hmm. of an answer is there are ways in which the structure of G itself is part of your inversion. I am thinking of a specific example, which I would need to go look up right now. And I would return to that later. Three though, if we generalize this to a ludicrous degree, then you could say, I have no idea what's going on. And so then you could make conceptually a G that contains all sorts of ways to parameterize the function. Let's say mm -hmm. you are not sure if y is a plus bx plus cx squared, but maybe depends on a, on a z and a t and an, and an f and another function, and you want to consider all combinations. And so essentially, instead of saying, I pick a polynomial basis of a degree, you would say, I'm going to pick a dictionary of bases that includes polynomials and sinusoids and you name it, spherical harmonics, mm -hmm. Legendre functions, exponentials, logistic mm -hmm. functions, and then try to fit the coefficients and then evaluate which ones are better resolved and so on. And so that is machine learning, or rather is an aspect of machine learning, mm -hmm. whereby you don't know what should go in. So you just stick it all in there and try to learn from the data what works best. Mm -hmm. So I, I find that personally very interesting. And that is that people have claimed, and again, I am thinking of some specific examples that I could point you to in the literature where or, you know, they write philosophically about the fact, well, if Newton hadn't worked out conservation of momentum mm -hmm. and thereby figured out, you know, Kepler's laws and whatever the attraction of gravity is. Remember, Newton didn't do any experiment beyond watching the planets go, right? But what if he was mm -hmm. blind and didn't even see the planets go anywhere? And he just felt apples falling on his head repeatedly. Then he probably would have said, I'm going to predict some dependence of the mm -hmm. acceleration of my cannonball off the Tower of Pisa, different... Uh, story. This is Galileo, right? But stick in something. And and maybe he'd stick in A plus BX plus CX to the two plus epsilon. And so uh, people do claim that we are actually able to not only discover the old laws of physics from machine learning, which is plausible, I would think, because if I give you 50 videos of, you know, golf balls being thrown, you probably figure out that the best power is a two. Although I think you're not going to be able to figure out if it isn't 2.1. But so machine learning now claims that they're going to be discovering physical laws that we don't even know about. And this is especially uh, in biology, which is, you know, so messy because it's chemistry plus physics plus, you know, whatever makes it biology. And it's not going to just be, oh, here's a Maxwell equation in a polarizable medium with some uh, Ohm's law. It's going to be rather something complicated. And then if you just throw a whole dictionary of G's at it, or a G mm -hmm. containing a whole dictionary of behaviors, then in mm -hmm. principle, people claim that, yeah, we probably very well might figure out what is going on. So three more examples of point three. You're too mm -hmm. young to remember that there used to be a machine translation on Yahoo and some other websites, mm -hmm. and it was comically bad. And it was trying to use grammar to translate, okay? So they had linguists doing it. And then suddenly it got completely much better because they forgot all grammar and they just did machine learning. And if you type, I am feeling like A, you know, going through my emails, you'll see, you know, banana is most 
you know, predictive of what I might want right at this time. And instead of translating that to French, it would just figure out from the context what the most likely word is. And so that's the general machine learning approach to machine translation, which has mm -hmm. gone through that shift. Forget parameterized laws of rules and grammar, but rather learn from context. Mm -hmm. Example two, uh, weather prediction. Do you really need to study meteorology to do weather prediction? Sorry, AOS grad students. But there are people claiming, no, you don't. You could just, you know, feed in a lot of weather stations and predict what the weather is going to be. So it's yeah, not satisfying. It's... It doesn't lead to understanding. But, you know, there's definitely a, a case for it. Example three, self-driving cars, you know, with a camera on every corner of your car and all that sort of data information. There is no intelligence in this car that knows the laws of physics, but it rather learns from these scenes what most likely collisions are and so on. But it's not taking a data point of an oncoming car and inverting for its velocity and predicting the impact. It's rather mm -hmm. just, you know, uh, diffusely machine learning these things. And then that is also just, you know, clearly better than mm -hmm. knowing too much. So what you're talking about is epistemic uncertainty is uncertainty about the model itself. And mm -hmm. yes, formalized ways, which I can give in simple examples, to more general ways, to the full-fledged machinery of machine learning are ways mm -hmm. of getting to that point. So let's go back to the polynomial case for, let's say y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, and then when we measure the data, we, we measure both X and Y, right? And we stop Y into the, the data vector and okay. we stop X terms into the G matrix. Yes. And what, hap what could happen is we, we know uh, the uncertainties of X. Okay, I, so that means I completely misunderstood uh, your question, but never mind because you're, that part we can also address, right? So mm -hmm. what I just answered was a different question, which is nonetheless important also. Now you're saying, what if you are fixing your model as a parameter dependence on an independent variable, which mm -hmm. however, you don't know for certain. Like you mm -hmm. take your, you know, you don't know exactly what time of the day that you record the planetary transit or whatnot. So here, there's also a couple of rules of thumb that you could use, and I can give you the beginning example of saying, let's say you have y equals a plus bx, you fit a line through, and you're saying, well, I don't really know where x is. Well, the homegrown recipe is plot y versus x and do a regression. As mm -hmm. you know, that measures the linear distance of y down the y-axis to mm -hmm. x. That's a vertical distance. Then flip the axis and regress x on y. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to acknowledge that there is uncertainty in X and measure the distance vertically on the new vertical mm -hmm. X axis down to the line and you get mm -hmm. a different regression line and then you split the difference. Okay, mm -hmm. that's clearly a hokey recipe here but it gets to your point where you're saying I could do vertical or horizontal distance measurements and the way to do it is flip it, regress it and average the result. Maybe I should draw it for the benefit here because these are clearly questions that should come up. Question that came up is what if G, your linear inverse operator, and I misunderstood your uncertain for unknown. And then we talked about try different things, go to chi square, go to F test and so on. Like the polynomial example with the varying alpha, formally build alternative models into it. I have an example that I can't remember right now, but I'm going to do it here. I'll return to it. And, you know, all machine learning, dictionaries and stuff. I'm just throwing the words here because you will hear them. Kernel density estimation, Gaussian process regression, all of that stuff. It begins with a model and it doesn't really know what to pick because it doesn't have physics. And so it needs to sort of find something. And if you're doing it poorly, you're just going to stick in something and live with the result. And then you know that you're not listening to this class because then you're saying you're not really you're not really asking the real question, which is, if I find my best model, is that any good? Could I find better model whose best parameterized version is better? That sort of question. Two, what if G is uncertain in the following sense that you meant, which I, I'm gonna paraphrase 
as follows. Y is an unknown A, B, C, but we've so far only incorporated noise in the Y data, but now both Y and X are uncertain. That's the real question. The noise is on Y. So my notation would have had to be updated, i.e. there exists noisiness on an X, on the X variable, okay? Couple quick examples. Here's the one I started. Have a noisy data set Y of X. I'm gonna try to plot something reasonable here. I'm gonna try to sort of mirror this, right? Which is more or less that, if I'm not mistaken. Which I'm gonna find out by looking through this here on the back, mirror it, yes, more or less, you know, so I flip it. And so I'm saying, well, look, if you regress according to what we all have been doing with the GTG inverse GT, and you get that, you regress your X and Y, you get a different line. And uh, as we know, the first line penalizes, oh, that's the word I haven't used, it penalizes, right? The penalty function, the cost function, the misfit, all of those things are synonyms. The vertical distance, that's your penalty. Now this is essentially the horizontal distance penalty because, you know, vertical is a new horizontal, right? And then combine an average. I'm not claiming this is a, maybe it's a method. I'm not claiming that it's a good method or the only method, but you do get an A, B, C with one half here. And now you get a different A, B, C, and I'll give it two halves to show different. And so you could sort of work out some system. Like anything I propose, you should just try it and realistically generate some Y's and some X's and realistically fit them with an exact A, B, C that you know, and then try to recover it and then see how far you get. And then you evaluate your method by simulation, which you should be doing. Third thing that I was about to say when I was going to draw the picture is, well, there's clearly a XY plot with the same data where I might find a third where the penalty is onto the line, right? Penalize distance to the line. That's an actual definition of an actual distance to the actual line that you however don't know yet, right? Neither vertical or horizontal because those are just privileged axes of looks here. But how far away you are from where you want to be in your model, that's another way of doing it. So that leads to a word that I'll just throw up here and uh, that's called totally squares. Books have been written about it. It's complicated. Why? Because it involves squares and square roots and things that are, you know, sort of ugly looking. If you look on my uh, uh, webpage, I have a routine I stole from somewhere, which is called TLS. It's one of the few routines I didn't make, but I acknowledge where I got it from. And you'll see that it actually does that. And I have used it. That's why I have it on my webpage in some of my papers. And it is vital to do so when you have uncertainty on both axes. But now let me ask the question of you and say, what method do we sort of already have in a way, don't we, to characterize dependencies of this particular sort, this linear sort, in a joint space X and Y where you have two PDFs on X and Y and you have a joint PDF of X comma Y and you have a marginal of X integrated over Y and Y integrated over X and you have a conditional of X given Y and Y given X. And I'm using all the words I've ever used. How do you measure the geometry of such correlations? Well, there I've said it, right? Remember the correlation coefficient which expresses the strength of these relations. And that doesn't give you the direction right now, uh, unless you, you know, do some more work, but hopefully it is clear that when you're asking the regression question, or you're asking this regression question, that when we first ever wrote down again, the definition of the correlation coefficient, we were taking into account the uncertainty on X and on Y, because that was 
built right into the differential correlation coefficient, which is the expected value of the product pairs of the x's and the y's shifted by their expected value and scaled by their standard deviations. And all of that normalized. So, well, rather, that is the way to normalize. So we've already come to this point, which means that on the way to totally squares and other words that come up, you're going to find expressions like, okay, figure out correlation coefficient and how that turns into this line. Then you'll start imagining the plot that I drew, which was, you know, there is some probability density distribution underlying what gives you these dots. That's the sort of contours I was drawing when I drew the correlation coefficient. So now you're realizing that the line that you really want is sure a best fit, least squares distance to the line, but also you're really asking about the geometry of a joint PDF. So if you're asking for the geometry of a joint PDF, you're going to encounter things like principal components analysis. And I haven't talked about that. You will have heard about it. You're going to start hearing things like PCA because the two components of this PDF are, you know, the best fitting axis and the orthogonal to it. You're going to start hearing things like SVD, single value composition, which I'm just going to throw out there as in you heard it here first. And so I'm trying to make the connection that if you're asking that question, you're asking this question, you have this as a possible solution, you are really asking a totally squares question, you're just, it's kind of hard, but you know, there's going to be eigenvectors and eigenspaces and all of that stuff comes in there. You look at my algorithm, you see, and then you are really asking about geometry of a joined PDF. And if indeed it is something like an ellipsoidal type of thing with a long axis and a short axis, you're asking for essentially eigenvectors of a correlation matrix. And then you're getting to notions of principal component analysis and independent component analysis and blah, blah, blah. And then you're ending up in this sort of same space. So that, that does connect to all of it. I'm going to say this is our assigned for today. I think that's been useful because I think these are very real questions for very real data analysis. I'm not answering them completely, but I'm saying if you read into what it takes to answer them, you're going to start recognizing again the things that we have covered and, and then some other ones that we didn't. So I actually briefly wanted to return to my last sheet from before. And I, as soon as I was done and I had the minutes, because we were running over time and I'm going to try not to, and like I filled my sheet. You should not copy this because it's ugly. You should just hear me and show you. This is where we were, right? And we got here because we went onto the generalized misfit criterion penalty. Now, so a Norman data space and a Norman model space weighted with a scale measure, a covariance and shifted or rather with respect to an expectation like you know you expect this residual to be zero which means you expect the prediction to be close to the data and you build a notion of a prior for the model in there and then you expect your solution to be not close necessarily but you're referencing your solution compared to where you thought it should be and most textbooks begin with this m being zero and it's it, as usual when it's zero you can't see it and when somebody says, I'm not using a prior, that means your prior is zero, whether you want it or not. Slight aside for those who are in the group meeting for you know people who are saying, I'm not using a window when I do spectral analysis. Yes, you are, but your window is all ones. Okay, and you're suffering the consequences. I'll return to that later. When I wrote this thing, then I figured I should owe you the name of this because it's kind of cool, you will read it. The sort of covariant space distance is called the Mahalanobis distance squared. Just the name of the scientist, but you will read it. If I had time for another aside, and I'm going to make an empty aside page here, another aside. Remember moment? We talked about moments in quite some detail. General forms of it with respect to a certain thing the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and then you can keep going. I told you, you can skip the moment generating function of Benda and Pearsall in their chapter 
three. However, you can also not skip it and learn something. It's a technique to find moments from other moments. And then there's a thing called cumulants. And most intro texts don't talk about it. And all serious texts begin with that because it is cleaner. But I did talk about moments. I also talked about norms. And I said the LP norm, remember, you can choose whatever, but you got to live with the consequence. And the L2 is easy because that's all differentiable, convex, doable. Quadratics are easy. I talked about the L infinity norm, the L1 norm, the L0, which isn't the proper norm, and so on. So in that list of important things, here's my undeveloped aside. And that is, what is a distance? And I think it's important. So let's talk about distance. Give me an example of how to measure distance. I don't remember actually the name. It's started with E. Yeah, I know what you mean. So I'm going to go like this here and I'll say that two points, two coordinates, the column R and R prime. I think you mean the length of the vector that connects this point with that point, commonly noted as this. Yeah. OK. And now you are, I want your brain to go to a word with a C for the coordinate system. Cartesian. But that's not what you want. And I want you to go to your word with E. And also, I want to give you the general culture of who is Cartesian. Why is it called Cartesian? Um, I I didn't get what you mean. Sorry. Oh, I'm 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 just I, I'm uh, non-linearly making a jump here and saying you should know why this is called Cartesian because it's called after something or someone. And do you know who or what it is called after? Descartes. So it's named after a, a, a French philosopher, and I'll extra curse of it right? Descartes, okay? The man of the cards. So that's just the origin of the name. Now, I think you're looking for the E word, and I'm saying it is also named after a person, but it is named after a Greek person. Euclidean. Euclidean, a... named after Euclid. So that's 2,000 years before Descartes, okay? Anyway. It helps me remember what I need to remember if I can make a connection with wherever it's named after. It makes more sense if I think about a bearded fellow in a robe wandering the streets of Sparta 2,000 years ago. All right, the Euclidean distance. Somebody else give me another form of a distance. If there's a Euclidean distance, I'm presuming that there's some form of non-Euclidean distance when you're not using yeah. coordinate systems. If you have a spherical coordinate system, distances in radius and then your two angles, whatever your naming system for them is. Yeah. Excellent. That's the one. Well, that's one one. So now I'm here on the surface of a sphere. I still only have two vectors. They're going to have a Euclidean distance, R and R prime, which are going to be given by, you know, some number. If I care to express it in X, Y, Z, most definitely. And that cuts right through the ball, right? The vector connecting those two cuts right through the ball. And that's really a poor measure of distance when I'm an earthling because the distance between here and LA is not cord because I don't have a tunnel to get there. So now you're saying it needs a new distance, which is a distance along the surface of the sphere. What are you going to call it? A geodesic? Yes, I like that. It's got to do with geodesy. That's called a geodesic because geo means earth. And you don't want to hear the next of it. Uh, geodesic, there you are. So you're in curved space. 
you will also hear the name of Ariman in this context. I'm just going to make a list of names. Rimanian for general culture. This is a free for all brainstorming session. Maybe I'll complete this here. What's important now is the cosine. How about I'll just write r dot r prime. And hopefully it makes sense to you that the dot part of r dot r prime is what? What is the length of the dot product? In spherical, you have the factor r squared cosine theta sine phi or vice versa. Okay, so I'm gonna go with you and say, you don't even have to have coordinates, but what you're okay. expressing is the fact that whatever you're doing, you get the length of the one vector times the length of the other vector, which on the same surface is r squared, and then the cosine of the angle towards them. That is what you are saying. Indeed, you are saying, you know, we're getting to the point that, you know, and I'm just mixing notation here a little bit, right? That measure of length, often as, you know, this thing here is going to be cosine of this angle, which in seismology is the epicentral distance from, you know, one place to the next one. So here is cosine delta. So, an angle is a measure of the distance, even though I'm not actually defining distance properly because it has to satisfy certain laws and so on, but that's a way of measuring how long it takes you from here to there. Along the surface of the sphere, you gotta twist it so it's some spherical angle. All right, more distances, open mic. Minkowski. Oh, I was gonna write that, that but I'm not true. allowing it. It's excessively erudite. They're all manifolds, right? It's a space-time measure and space and time are related. And so that gives you a particular distance. And believe it or not there, correct me if I'm wrong, people talk about geodesics too. They're just talking about a different measure. And, uh, you know, but so yes, I like that. Good word to have. I like to make lists. Maha la nobis, that's a distance in a covariant space. I've already just defined it. That's a way of saying how far you are away from something by saying, you know what, let's just scale it by the, by the scale of the distribution it's drawn from, okay? More distances. Like the real distance, you, like the wave travel. It's not like a following a straight line, but following a curve. That's, that's uh, uh, an arc length, if there is a thing. If you're on a trajectory, okay, I like it. How about I take it? And then I'll do another thing with it. Okay, so you're asking the following. You're saying, now there is some place here. I'll give you the image that comes to my mind. You're saying, well, I start here and I start in there and there is a trajectory. And you're saying, what is the length of that trajectory? That's a measure of distance, loosely speaking. So I'll say distance with that. And so I'm gonna just name this after Mr. Trajector, okay? So you shoot a cannonball, there's a ballistic distance. You shoot a seismic wave, it's however long the wave took. You know, it's a path in space, there's all sorts of things. Okay, I want now a special, special case of that, which I actually wanted to talk about, which you will hear. And I'm gonna ask for you to make a mental connection between the fact that the Euclidean distance is really your familiar distance it works with squares, right? Because that distance is the square root of the sum of squares of the difference of the coordinates of these points. That you learn in presumably third grade, I would guess. This you learn later because it's cosines. But now I'm saying, if that's quadratic, what sort of distance would be coming out if, if I call quadratic Euclidean and Euclidean L2, then make the connection with my norm and then say, what would be sort of an L1 distance? There is a distance called like the taxi cab in topology. I love it. That's the one I wanted here for now. I'll correct the spelling later. So I want to do this here. I'm on a grid here. 
what's a synonym for that actually named after something that I can capitalize? Manhattan. And why? Because of the city right. and the taxi cabs in it. <laughs> taxi cab or Manhattan distance, because nobody in New York wants to know how you you collegue and connect two points because you can't go there unless you're friends with all the doormen. But the Manhattan distance is you got to go this way, that way, then that way, then this way, and then that way. And then you end in this point and you add all those things up in absolute values of the X's and Y's and you have sort of an L1 type of distance. Okay, that's Manhattan distance. So people are measuring norms between vectors and norms of the vectors. You know, we're always in L2, we're always in collegian, but in spherical, it's all different. In really, that's the one we really have been using all along because it makes a lot of sense, which is, of course, a Euclidean combination of something that's been reweighted. That's the one we really want. Uh, the taxi cab distance, however, is something that you'll do is you'll do L1 type of problems. And of course, the L infinity would be what is the maximum jump in one of the coordinates you'd have to do which is, of course, something that if you're trying to optimize something and you want to find, you know, the distance between one point and the next point, you go, like, start moving in the biggest coordinate direction where you have the most to travel. That would be an L infinity distance. I am, however, regretting that none of you say distance that is on all of our minds. Social distance. Thank you. Sad face. Nobody's talking that in meters. This is impossibly normalized by what we call social distance. And before COVID, people would tell you that the social distance in Australia is three times as large as the social distance in Greece. Humans stand much closer together in some countries than in others, this being an aside. I'll add one more distance, AL. It's not really a distance, but it, it, you do read it. And like you start reading around, it's called pullback Leibler. Anyway, I'm a fan of trying to encourage you to think that how all the pieces that are already in your brain connect and how it's all sort of variants of the same thing. What Kobach Library is, is a way of measuring differences between distributions. Frederick, the KS test, trying to get the maximum distance between two PDF, right? Ultimately, the Kolmogorov Smirnov test is using basically a Euclidean distance in a quantile quantile space. Um, actually, I'm thinking of one more distance which you're going to get, and you've also mentioned, and we've also mentioned, very important recently also in seismology, Fields Medal went to a person studying it in mathematics, and yet it is very down to earth. This is my last hint. Earth mover distance? Yes, the earth mover distance. Isn't that a wonderful name? Have you guys heard of this? The earth mover distance, also known as the optimal transport distance, also known as the... Are you looking for the Wasserstein metric? Yes, yes, that's it, that's it. Wasserstein, Wasserstein. It's all jargon and none of it is important, but you're gonna read it all. And I just want you to have fond memories of this class and go, oh, I like that thing. All right, so what is the earth mover distance? If you imagine two PDFs, one way to ask how far apart they are is how much you have to shift them. Another one is how much you have to scale them. Another one is if you took bits of probability from one end of the pile and moved it to the other end of the pile, you'd be moving a probability distance. But just like if you had to ask how many scoops of dirt do you have to take to make two piles of dirt look the same, the question is, let's say you have two piles of dirt this is not speaking respectfully about the earth, but anyway, here's a pile of dirt. Here's another pile of dirt. How do you move one pile of dirt to another pile of dirt? Those of you who have never handed a, been handed a shovel, it's not going to resonate with you. But one way of moving this pile of dirt to there is, you know, to begin on the left and pick this scoop of dirt and move it all the way to the right, because, you know, that's a good start, right? And then you're saying that's certainly spending a lot of energy, but it is possible. And another way of beginning is to move this pile of dirt on this tapered edge here. And how about you just move it a little closer because you're gonna need it here too. But then you're saying, well, maybe, what if I move this piece here, you know, to here? And then, you know, and, and so it asks of all the possible ways 
that you could be moving things, which one is the optimal transport ways, the way in which you get the least tired moving dirt, which is certainly, you know, a geologic reference relevance um, and also just energetic. So there is this notion of optimal transport, but you should also realize it's gonna be really hard to figure this thing out because you have to evaluate all ways of moving dirt for every grain, for every bit of probability in the distribution to go from one place to the next. Now, why am I on this tangent? Because, uh, you know, we're always going L2, least squares, Euclidean, Gaussian stuff, but the, the, that's, you know, has been known since the time of Gauss. I do want to teach you that the excitement is that when you change it, because you realize sometimes you have to change it. When your distributions are not Gaussian, when your measures are not usefully quadratic because that weights the outline too much, when you want more robust statistics, when you're just constrained by geometry, any other reason by which you may need to change your definition of what it means to fit data or what it means to measure the size of a solution that you then wish to constrain. All those ways are ways in which the notion of a distance come up, loosely speaking, a distance, a discrepancy, a misfit, a tension, discrepancy. Those are all ways by which I'm now thinking of measures of size because that would be a distance with respect to zero of some coordinate system. Measures of distance between two distributions, between two vectors, sizes of vectors and of distributions and all of that sort of thing. Uh, I've got one more distance, this is a cool one. And also used in inversion and in geophysics. What is the distance between dog and God. You all remember playing those games in like newspapers? Is this like the hamming distance or something? Yeah, I forget what the name of it is, but you know, you're, you know that you got to take one letter and change it to another letter. And so you got to change two letters, right? But now the distance between coronavirus and carnivorous, same letters, you got to switch a few of them around. Did you realize that? So that's a way of measuring distances. And that also is a distance between two genes. What is the distance between gatata and takaga? If this is your genes, then you got to measure how many whatever base pairs you switch. And so for those of you in molecular biology that are trying to fit a molecular structure in some genes or something, they're using that distance. I'm going to see if that is the Hamming distance. Yes, it is, more or less. Let's just call it that. Wow, this is an excellent tangent because I'm filling the page. The Hamming distance, like, you know, substitute God for dog, carnivorous for coronavirus. That's got a certain distance. Um, all right, well, that is a huge aside. Piles of dirt in Gaussian distribution. I really wanted to begin by saying that I was going to finish this, and then I got somewhat distracted, but I think productively so. Remember this, right? And we're back on L2 on the normal distance in the Gaussian, and I had written this. And I then said, here's the measure, and it's Mahalanobis. And then I went to my distance diatribe. And then I said, look, I'm going to mess up the. So don't feel the need to copy here because it's a lot of stuff. I just wanted you to see it. And then you can either copy it from the record or I can send you a thing here. It's just too many things. I think this is where we ended, right? The probability density distribution of a vector x. And I definitely wrote this exponential of x compared to some vector of expectations, mu, this is a capital mu in Greek, inversely weighted like the Mahalanobis distance by the covariance, which is big sigma, which I say is made up of squared little sigmas, which is confusing, but a fact of life. I didn't point out but that I think you should know though, that this is a dot product again, it's a quadratic. And if these things are normal of themselves, if those residuals are normal, then I'm sort of forming a chi-squared. So you have to, your mind has to jump by seeing, aha, sums of squares, chi square, right, of the dimension of X. And so we'll just put that in your brain later. So I'm just going to have found a model predicated 
on this thing, which is what we've been doing all along. We're gonna have our residuals. How have we been inspecting our residuals all the time? Well, by forming some of squares, right? Is what we're minimizing and that's the chi-square. So there it is, right? And when I derive the chi-square with one and then two variables, I you know, explicitly had it there, right? The, the Gaussian is an exponential of a chi-square. All right, I didn't do the half here because I wasn't finished writing and I don't remember these things, so I looked it up. I also didn't finish the normalization for the same reason. The proper normalization is two pi to the one half of the dimension of X divided by the square root of the determinant of sigma. Okay, so that's what you find when you look this up properly. I then pointed, I then said, look, look, what is the sigma, right? This is the variance matrix or the variance covariance matrix or the covariance matrix. Different textbooks will give you the same thing in different words. I pointed you to the confusion that, you know, this is full of sigma squares and diagonal and covariances, which I haven't ever written this way, but a sigma one, one and a sigma two, two and a sigma two, three, that's the covariances. Previously, I would have called this covariance of X and Y, X and Z, Y and Z and so on. And so new notation, right? Then I showed you Ben, and Pearsall chapter three, equation 363, which have this as a special case for two variables. Before I go there, I want to go through the special case of one variable, which is, of course, you just recall, which is that equation, which appeared like this in the notes earlier. So I'm just copying that. No need for you to stress writing it until you fill it in later. So the determinant of a one dimensional variance matrix, square root is just sigma, two pi over one to the one half of the dimension is just the square root of two pi. So all consistent, and this just comes out the way you normally see it. So you see that. Then you'll look at Ben, Beth, and Pearsall as one example, and they'll give you what is it for X and Y? I hadn't written this, so I just wrote it to make that connection. So you write it for two variables. They're gonna call X and Y, and then I ran out of space because it's kind of ugly. So please don't copy this, right? But you look up equation 363 and convince yourself that it's just really just all this garbage. And the reason is that I want you to see that in the two variable case, the sigmas, they're not writing sigma one and sigma one two. They're usually writing it via the correlation coefficient because you know that's useful. So they're writing the sigma as sigma one squared and sigma two squared in the diagonal and then rho, which we previously defined as a correlation coefficient, sigma one times sigma two, which is in the case that the variables are correlated. That's what it expresses. That's well, rather regardless of it, it's the definition just a substitution of what we defined rho to be. We defined rho to be the covariance divided by the variances. And we now need the covariance on the off diagonal. And so now I'm saying, well, that's the correlation times the variances. The mu vector is just the vector of mu is mu one, mu two, mu x, mu y. The inverse of sigma, we talked about, you gotta do this by hand. It is not difficult. You flip A and B in the matrix, you flip the signs of the Bs and then you write it out and you see that's exactly what that is. And then you normalize by the determinant, which is also not a surprise because remember I said, you should remember that the inverse of any matrix depends on the inverse of its determinant. That's coming back again. So I just was idle after lecture thinking I really should write this out and like, where did this all come from? And so Bender and Pearsall writes 363 somewhat generally, 353, they're writing it even more special. And take a look at 366, and these expressions come out. And so when anyone makes pictures of covariances, then they like pone clouds and stuff, they're gonna say, oh, well, take a correlation code because I'll generate some data, you know, they're, they're basically simulating that. I don't ever remember that. I barely remember this, but I remember the important parts of it, which you should too, right? An exponential, of a quadratic, which I've made the point is some sort of a Mahalanobis distance, which is a distance with respect to a first moment scaled by a second moment. So here is Mahalanobis, here is Gauss. I point to a book by Davison for my own references called Statistics or something like that. So the pieces have more or less come together. I do need to give you one or two more things about linear inversion. In fact, I've been putting it off for some reason. It's coming. Mark my words that I'm going to start my page here. 
properly dealing with constrained inversions where you say, I need a line that best fits my point cloud, but also, by the way, it should go through this particular point, or I need to satisfy my data in a certain way. But by the way, it, it would be best if these seven parameters sum up to 33. I'll talk about introducing constraints. It's a question that naturally comes up. I used to not do it, and somebody says, what if I need this? I'm like, oh, right, there you are. But of course, then you realize once you write it, that it connects really nicely to the underdetermined problem, which we've formally done already, but not come up with the actual operator to do something that formalizes this in a good way. And that is definitely something that I need to do with you. So that's coming and that we're definitely gonna have to do this next week. And then I will give you new homework, which is gonna do an easy and interesting, relevant, nonlinear problem, nonlinear problem, which is going to solve by linearization of nonlinear problems. And my distraction from today will be totally worth it because it'll be about a Euclidean distance of an earthquake to wherever you record it. So I'll be mixing epicentral distance in Cartesian space, which then becomes a Euclidean distance. But as you all know, Euclidean distance is the square root of some squares. And the distance to an earthquake depends on the velocity with which the waves propagate to you. And if you're recording the times that waves hit various stations, then you, if you write down the inverse problem, you realize that it depends nonlinearly on the location and then solving for the location you will be able to do by linearization and iteration. And then, then that leads to a very common class of models where you're gonna have to do it at some point. And this is one way of dealing with it. Linearize, iterate, get the solution. And you'll see that then in your homework. And so I definitely have to do that. And then to show you where that ends up, then I'm going to wrap it up by saying that I bring Bayes back, all right? I told you it'd be back because there's a posterior, there's likelihood, there's a prior. I'll give you the example of just putting the pieces back together. They're all exponentials. Multiplying exponentials means adding arguments, taking logs, remove those things. And you'll see how maximum likelihood optimization is exactly the same thing as you know regular inversion or Gaussian models. And you know, I think you'll appreciate the details. And uh, I'll just, just jot down some words here for my remembrance that you're going to hear about. You know, more words will be coming. You're going to write it, but not even speak about it. All right. Um, I think that's my plan. I will have six lectures, hopefully, for spectral analysis. What's not surprising is going to be a combination of all the before lectures, and you'll appreciate that.